Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Sébastien Deleuze. I work for Pivotal and the Spring Framework, mainly on the web, reactive, and Kotlin stuff. I'm also a staff member of a Mixit conference in France. And today we are going to talk about Spring and Kotlin. Currently, the most popular way to, will, to build web applications is using Spring Boot and Java, obviously. And we are going to see how far we can go uh, using Spring Boot, but with the uh, Kotlin language. Uh, at the beginning of the year, I introduced uh, the Kotlin support, an official support uh, in Spring Framework 5. And we see a huge amount of feedback. And a lot of people seem to be excited. So we have continued to polish to improve this support. And today, I'm going to show you what, uh, what is available. In order to see what are the features available, we are going to migrate a typical Spring Boot application from Java to Kotlin. And we are going to do that uh, using multiple steps that you can, uh, uh, you can have a look to the code on uh, this GitHub uh, repository. The first step will be uh, switching from Java to Kotlin without any, uh, taking any advantage of the new Kotlin support feature, so just changing the language. Then we are going to migrate from Spring Boot 1 to Spring Boot 2. Uh, Spring Boot 2 leverages uh, Spring Framework 5 and its official Kotlin support. Then we are going to change the Spring MVC um, web framework to use a new WebFlux uh, non-blocking and reactive framework using the same annotation-based programming model. And the last step on server side will be using the new functional and uh, functional API and Kotlin DSL. We are going to finish the work by using Kotlin instead of JavaScript to develop your front end because uh, one of the goals is to be able to leverage the same language, the same knowledge uh, for your various, uh, various part of your applications. So let's start by migrating from Java to Kotlin. The easiest way to start a new Spring Boot project with Kotlin is using the start.spring.io uh, website. Uh, it supports uh, Kotlin in addition to Java and Groovy. And you can use this, uh, this special URL to pre-select the Kotlin language. So when you share a start.spring.io uh, link, uh, you can use that to make Kotlin used by default. When we started to build the Spring project with Kotlin um, a few time ago, a typical issue was that Kotlin has final classes and methods by default. That's a choice. That's a design language choice. And it does not play very well with uh, Java config and transactional support, for example, because at runtime, we need to extend these classes and this method with CJLib, for example. And you ended up by using adding this open keyword at a class and method level, and that was not super nice. So we, we discussed and worked with the JetBrains team. And we ended up by, they have created a Kotlin Spring compiler plugin, which is set up at a Maven or Gradle level. It is automatically enabled on start.spring.io when you create a Kotlin project. And it automatically opens um, uh, Spring, and, uh, Spring annotated classes and methods. And it leverages the um, uh, meta annotation support. So even if in your company you have um, custom uh, annotations, meta annotated with add component, for example, they will be taken in account and automatically opened by this mechanism. So in, in summary, when you create uh, a project using start.spring.io, or if you just add manually this plugin, this is just a regular classes and, and methods. The first part where Kotlin really improved uh, our code is obviously by allowing to write uh, more uh, concise code. So for our domain model, at the left, you have the Kotlin code, and at the right, uh, Java 1, which is uh, going up to the floor when I display everything. And obviously, we can write very uh, efficiently, very fast, this Java code, because our IDE provides us various automating uh, things to generate getters, setters, uh, equals, hash code, etc. But when you have to read, when you have to debug, when you have to maintain this code, I guess uh, I prefer maintain the, the Kotlin version. So here we are using uh, classes from Kotlin with this short syntax where you declare at the same time the properties and the constructor. That's similar to what uh, is available in, in Scala, for example. 
I'm using the val keywords because while in Java, that's usual to have getters and setters, so mutable uh, classes. In Kotlin, we try to use more uh, immutable uh, classes, especially for the domain model. So it's a best practice to use val to say it's immutable, unlike var, which are mutable properties. I'm using the same annotations. You see that the, ty the type is uh, after the name of the property. Um, Kotlin deal natively with null safety. That means that uh, the string and the local date time, most of the properties are uh, not nullable. Uh, and that means that Kotlin will check at compile time that you will, you will never put a null value in that. And you, when you want to, to make a type nullable, you add this short question mark, like in the description property. That means this field is basically optional and it, it can take null value. And in Kotlin, uh, nullable values are a little bit like the optional type in, in, uh, in Java, but they also apply to parameters in, in various other use cases. The data keywords allow to generate automatically um, uh, hash code equals to string and also a copy and other facilities to, to automatically. So let's have a look to a typical Spring MVC controller written in Java. So that's a regular one. It leverages the uh, latest Spring 4 feature by um, uh, using uh, implied auto wired So since there is a single constructor, it will be automatically auto wired No need to use this annotation. I'm using also the shortcut annotation get mapping, post mapping, which are aliases to uh, request mapping uh, to, to specify directly the, the method. And then if I have a look to the Kotlin version, that's basically the same. Uh, with shorter code because uh, public is the default for classes and methods. Uh, because I use this same uh, short notation to declare the constructor and the properties uh, at the same time. Don't forget the private um, uh, keyword here because by default that's public. So here we want to make that uh, thing uh, private. No need to expose that on the public API. And then you see that I'm leveraging the Kotlin type inference and this short notation with the equals um, uh, for one-liners function to provide a very concise implementation of my controller. Some Java developers and others could be puzzled because we don't see the type. Uh, so uh, two points about that. The first thing is that Kotlin is as statically typed as Java. So even if the syntax looks like a little bit like dynamic groovy, we are, uh, uh, we are as statically typed as in Java. And I would say Kotlin is even more statically typed than Java because it deals with null safety, which is additional safety and the type system. You have the option to enable type ins in ID. So I have enabled that by default for all my projects in order to be able to see the inferred type. So I don't have to write the return type, but I can see what is inferred by Kotlin. Uh, you can enable these uh, parameters in, in ID and you will see the inferred type like uh, the functionalities for parameter names. Another nice feature of Kotlin is to be able to write expressive test name with backticks. So backticks can be used uh, everywhere in, in main or test classes. But uh, obviously I try to avoid using that in my SRC main code and mainly use that to write expressive test name. So instead of using the usual camel case notation for my test names, I'm using this backticks notation uh, emoji as just here for fun. You, you can just use regular sentence. But when you run your, your tests, uh, you see this nice sentence that can explain uh, in a more readable way what are you testing. And yeah, that's, that's pretty useful. So uh, until now, we have not taken uh, any advantage of the Kotlin support. We are just using the, the nice feature of the Kotlin language. So when I say that Spring loves Kotlin, that means that we officially support it, and we support it in the various parts of the, uh, the Spring ecosystem. Uh, Spring Framework 5 uh, provides the foundation of such support, and uh, uh, Reactor Core, Spring Data K, Spring Boot 2, which will be available at the end of the year, uh, leverage that support and also provide some specific Kotlin support uh, things. Uh, we don't provide any additional Kotlin extension uh, jars. Uh, the Kotlin support is directly provided inside the Spring Framework, the Spring Data, the Spring Boot jars. So what we have done is that we have, uh, in addition to the regular Java API, which is usable directly in Kotlin, because a key point is that Kotlin has a very good Java interoperability, we provide uh, DSLs and extensions directly in the Spring jars. And when you use Spring 
with your Kotlin project, it's available um, directly. There is a detailed uh, reference documentation, so feel free to have a look. It details every uh, Spring Framework features, and we are working on similar uh, documentation for other uh, Spring projects. There is also an API documentation. So, like I said, the um, Spring uh, Kotlin API is the Java one plus some additional Kotlin stuff. And uh, you have this specific Kotlin API documented and available. That's like a, a Java doc, but for, for Kotlin. So, obviously, uh, when we work with Kotlin, we will use that with Spring Boot. So, Redix Spring Boot 1 application with Kotlin is like that. You have uh, top level functions, so main don't have to be included into a class. You can use that directly at the top level. Um, this is uh, the version uh, that is using Spring Boot 1, which does not provide any Kotlin support. And with Spring Boot 2, we provide a top level function called Run Application that leverages a uh, Kotlin type system to be able to just specify full application without using colon colon class dot Java. Uh, which is shorter. Uh, you can declare additional bins using the same uh, type inference feature that I shown previously. Um, so now, now let's talk about the extensions we are providing. So we are providing additional Kotlin specific uh, functions uh, just provided in, in Spring Framework, and we provide extensions. So, Kotlin extensions are the possibility to add a new function into existing types. That sounds a little bit strange when you come from Java world, but you can see that as uh, util classes that you can directly call on the, on the type, so that's mainly syntactic sugar, but a quite useful syntactic sugar because that allows us, instead of providing some Kotlin application context or Kotlin wrappers everywhere, we just use the right, the right same uh, classes and we just add a few Kotlin extensions on these existing classes. So, for example, we use this extension to add a uh, set operator to the model uh, class, which is useful for Spring framework views. And that allows us to provide this nice uh, array-like syntax uh, instead of using uh, model.add attributes and, and make our code mo more Kotlinish. A much more powerful extension is this one. Uh, Rayfight type parameters are a, a nice feature from Kotlin, which allows to get the generic types at runtime, unlike Java. So that's a way uh, to work around type erasure. So I have taken the worst uh, possible example in Spring. So sorry, but that's how do you get a list of something using REST template? Um, hmm. You can tweak that with arrays, but if you really want to use list, you have to use uh, parameterized type reference, which is a trick to get uh, the generic type at runtime. And it's only, only available with exchange, so I'm forced to use exchange, and I ended up with this not so readable code. Uh, in Kotlin, using the extensions, on REST operations, which is the interface of REST template. I'm just leveraging Kotlin a feature that is able to take, uh, to, to get this time from the generic type, and you can see the Kotlin version is much, much more uh, readable. So we provide this kind of extensions in, into the various places where uh, it makes sense in Spring API. We also leverage Kotlin mutable information uh, to determine request param and auto wire required attributes. Uh, so, uh, in fact, we, um, Spring Framework 5 is able to understand Kotlin type system. It knows if a type is nullable or not. So, in that example, foo uh, is a parameter that will be auto-wired and it's not nullable, and bar is a nullable, um, a nullable parameter. And when it will be auto-wired, the foo bin will, man will be mandatory, and the bar uh, bin will be optional. Um, it's also uh, taken in account for request param, so if I add the at request param annotation on a new label parameter, it will be understood as request param required equal false without specifying that uh, explicitly. This is considered by many as the most important feature of our Kotlin support, even if it is also useful for Java developers. Um, we have added some null safety of the Spring API. So by default, Kotlin considers Java uh, libraries types uh, of the API as platform types. So you can see when you are in Kotlin, you have this exc exclamation mark. The platform types means that Kotlin is not able to say if a type is nullable or not because 
uh, Java does not uh, deal with that information. So what we have done, and, and Jürgen and me have spent a fair amount of time to do, do that with huge commits, it's to add null safety annotation in the whole Spring Framework code base um, to define clearly the semantics. So uh, the idea is to, we have introduced uh, at non null API, at non null fields, at null label annotations. These annotations are meta annotated with GSR305 annotations, which define basically the semantics. And we have put the at non null API annotations at the package level to define the default in uh, all the code which is in this package to non null. So by default, each parameter, each return value is considered as non null. And when a specific return value or a specific parameter is nullable, we specify that with the at nullable annotations. And when you are developing a, a Kotlin project and that you add at Maven or Gradle level, the free compiler args equals uh, GSR 305 equals strict. It means that Kotlin will interpret this information, even if you don't have GSR 305 jars in your class pass, as uh, a null safety information. And th th the advantage is that you get a full null safe API in your application. So concretely, it basically prevents any null pointer exception to occur. Uh, Kotlin deal with null safety at compile time, and it avoids your code to generate um, null pointer exception at, at runtime. So a pretty important feature. Um, we, st we are still working with JetBrains to provide uh, additional uh, uh, null safety for generic type arguments, uh, var args, and array elements, because it is not taken in account by default currently, but it's coming. Configuration properties. I guess that's the main remaining pain point where, when you create uh, a Spring Boot application with Kotlin. Um, basically, the null safety feature of Kotlin is not a very good fit with the current add configuration properties. So when you try to use them uh, in order to get your configuration files in a type safe way, you ended up by um, putting a lot of nullable properties uh, uh, with the null default values, and it's also var, it's not val. So with Spring Boot 2, there is a nice feature coming that will be super useful with Kotlin. It is the ability uh, to use interfaces uh, to define your configuration properties. And the big thing is that uh, that's enabled to use immutable properties, because configuration is not expected to change during the runtime. And also, it allows you to use just non-nullable types and uh, Spring Boot 2 will uh, inject by default uh, the, the, the right implementation. It's not yet available. It could be also interesting to support data classes, but it, it raises um, a set of open questions, so I, I think it won't be able to in Spring Boot 2. But with interface-based uh, configuration properties, if, if they make it for Spring Boot 2 final version, I, I think that's pretty great uh, when you use that in Kotlin. Another thing that we support in GUnit 5 is, uh, in Spring Framework 5 and Spring Boot 2 is GUnit 5. And GUnit 5 introduces a, a very nice feature when you play with Kotlin. It's non-static before all and after all. I guess you, you already know that um, uh, with GUnit 4, at before class and at after class need to be static. And what is static in Java world need to be companion object in Kotlin. I won't show this feature. That's not the feature I prefer, and, and the code is not very nice. So when we use GUnit with Kotlin, and if you use GUnit 5, you can define a new per-class lifecycle, because by default, GUnit instantiates your class one time per class, per test, and you can change this behavior by defining in the GUnit-platform.properties, uh, you can set the per-class lifecycle by default, and when you set that, GUnit 5 will instantiate your class one time per class, and that allow you to use a non-static at before all and at after all method. So that's a pretty good fit with Kotlin, and uh, that's also, uh, I guess, a useful feature in Java. And if you combine all these things, you can write a very nice specification-like test with Kotlin and GUnit 5. Uh, Kotlin brings its own ecosystem of testing frameworks. So for example, there is spec, which is a dedicated Kotlin framework to write specification-like tests. But the integration with the IDEs is not super great. The Spring integration is not that great. And also, it's uh, usually difficult to write integration tests. Uh, so I prefer using uh, Kotlin and GUnit 5, uh, leveraging the nested classes support, 
the expressive uh, test method names, and by doing that, you basically ended up with a nice specification like test framework, well supported in your IDE, and I, I think that's a, that's a good fit for most use case. This one is an um, experimental feature, so you can, I have created a Kotlin dash script that templating example that use that. Uh, it's being able to use uh, Kotlin uh, for templates. Uh, not only because I use, uh, I like to use Kotlin everywhere, but uh, the idea is to avoid learning a new template system. There is so many, and Kotlin is usable as a script language. And when you use that as a script language, you can uh, leverage the Spring MVC and Spring Web Flux GSR 223 support. Uh, I warn you, there is quite a lot of things to set up. So it's a generic GSR uh, 20, uh, 223 support. So uh, yeah, it's not it, it's not uh, straightforward. You have to uh, add caching because compiling Kotlin for each page is quite slow. So you need to have caching. I have put a, a quick and dirty implementation in this example, but the result is that you can use uh, Kotlin. So here is an example of multi-line string in Kotlin. I'm using another feature, which is string interpolation. And basically, you can build an internal uh, templating system that deals with internationalization, with nested template, etc. So yeah, maybe a good idea if you want to contribute something in the Kotlin and Spring ecosystem. Now, we are going to use the Webflux framework. So Spring Framework 5 comes with two web stacks, a Spring MVC and Spring Webflux. Spring MVC, it's uh, the same uh, web framework that you already know, and there is a Spring uh, MVC 5. Uh, Spring MVC is not deprecated, it's still super useful, it's relevant for a wide range of use cases, but we also provide an additional non-blocking web framework, which is based on reactive streams instead of servlets. The use cases where it is useful are streaming, scalability. Uh, in Spring MVC, when you have a lot of concurrent requests, uh, one thread is used for, for each request. With Webflux, it is based on a, on a non-blocking runtime using uh, Netty or the non-blocking API of Servlet 3.1 or Undertow or any kind of uh, engine supported. So that's a good use case for that. Uh, streaming with the server sent events and WebSocket uh, is also a good use case. And every use case that implies latency, basically, so when you call remote web services, which are usually slow, uh, that's a good fit. So if you are building microservices architecture, that's also a nice use case. A very quick word on Re reactive streams that we are using as a foundation. Reactive streams is a kind of specification that um, uh, specify how a publisher and a subscriber will exchange data in a non-blocking way using events. Uh, so basically, you start the transfer by the subscriber subscribe to the publisher, and the, the difference is with other mechanism is that with the back pressure mechanism, uh, nothing happens. The subscriber has to, to request one, two, three more data chunk. So basically, no data is sent by the publisher before the subscriber uh, requests this data. And in practice, that's a kind of volume tuning to control the amount of in-flight data. So when you have a very fast publisher that avoid to get the subscriber completely overwhelmed by too much data, and that allow basically the publisher and the subscriber to, to exchange data in a, in a friendly way. It's useful to deal with infinite streams, but also with uh, 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 finite streams, or even for single, single values. Uh, the data transfer could end with a complete or an error event, and an error event as an exception parameter. And that's, yeah, that's uh, the, um, the, the roots of our uh, reactive non-blocking support. Webflux implementation in ba is based on reactive streams and on Rector, which is uh, a pivotal baked reactive API. But uh, that's for the internals. On your application level, you can use every kind of asynchronous type, so completable future, uh, flow publisher, which is uh, basically reactive streams API integrated in Java 9. Reactive Java, Eric Java 1, Eric Java 2, uh, Reactor, obviously, and any uh, Reactive Streams based uh, Reactive API uh, like Aka Streams, for example. So let's just focus on Reactor uh, for my uh, upcoming example. So Reactor provides two main types, Flux and Mono. 
Flux is a reactive stream publisher, so Flux implements reactive stream publisher and uh, deal with zero to n elements. That's similar to uh, Eric Java uh, Observable or Flowable, for example, in terms of API. And we have tried to reuse the same API than you have in reactive extensions. So if you already know Eric Java, you know a good part of the Flux API. We also provide a monotype, which is a publisher for zero to one element. So you can see that as a kind of uh, reactive future or reactive promise. And it provides operators that are specifically designed to deal with a zero or one element. Typical use case is, for example, you want to combine the data coming from a streaming API like Twitter uh, with a REST API. So you do that by using the Webflux client, which is called Web Client. So that's a kind of reactive, uh, improved version of the REST template that allows to request REST web services, but also request some streams, uh, streaming data, and expose the result as a flux. You can use the operators of your reactive API to combine this data together and eventually expose that as a REST uh, web service or a server sent event streams or web socket, like you want. A key point to understand is that reactive APIs are functional API. That means uh, you, will, um, you will write different code than the regular imperative style programming that you are used to in the blocking world. Um, and a key difference is that you are going to use this kind of uh, dot notation where you build your pipeline of transformation. So here we are getting the data from a main fetch weather uh, web service using this mono-based API. Then uh, when there is an error, we log a message. And when there we define a timeout of two seconds, and when the timeout occurs, we use a backup service, which use maybe outdated data, but locally. And we transform uh, the domain model object to a message. And here, we don't execute that. We just define the transformation. And at the end, we need to trigger the processing effectively. So if you do that manually, you will call dot .subscribe. When you use that in Webflux, that will be done automatically by uh, the framework. So this kind of new way of writing your code is uh, as drawback because you have a lot of new things to learn, and that's a different kind of programming. But it, it comes also with a lot of advantages because you can do much more powerful things. So yeah, drawback and advantages. We use Kotlin to provide uh, extensions to React or Core, uh, which is, like I said, similar to Eric Java. Uh, so uh, you can use, for example, the two mono extensions, which allow to transform any kind of object to a mono instance. We have the same kind of extension with two flux on iterable and collections. You can transform uh, easily uh, an exception to a mono or a flux. And um, since uh, testing facilities in Reactor are, are in a different project, in Reactor tests, uh, we have not been able to put directly a dot test method on, on flux and mono. But the nice thing is that uh, with the test extensions, uh, you can apply that on every reactive streams publisher, even other, uh, for example, you can write that on, on Flowable from Eric Java 2 as well, and that allows you to write this nice code. Uh, a drawback of reactive API in Java is that you can't add additional operators to them directly because uh, reactive APIs are using fluent APIs, and basically you can't add something uh, after in Java. So a nice use case of Kotlin extensions are to be able to plug uh, the reactive extensions. So for, for example, we have some ma uh, mathematic uh, extensions of Reactor, which allow to do the maximum, the sum of uh, or average operation on a flux. And in Java, you have to use this kind of utils method to apply it on a flux. Uh, in Kotlin, we can directly use and add an average uh, method that will be available if that's a flux of integer, but not if that's a flux of string. Uh, now, let's have a look to this kind of web flux annotation-based controller. So you can see that the programming model is the same, even if in terms of types and codes, the implementation will be different because we are dealing with mono and flux of users instead of dealing by, uh, with plain values. Another key point to understand is that when you are building a non-blocking or a reactive application, your uh, stack need to be reactive and, and non-blocking um, from the web part to the persistence part and also on the HTTP client part. So Spring Data K provides reactive support for MongoDB, Redis, Cassandra, and Coachbase. And you can use that in Java and in Kotlin. 
and uh, yeah, uh, SQL support will maybe come later. I can discuss that after the talk if you want more detail. Uh, this is an experimental feature, not supported yet, so be warned, but there is a very interesting feature in Kotlin, which is coroutines. So coroutines are lightweight threads. A, a big limit of regular thread is that you can't create too much thread because it consumes a lot of resources in your, uh, in your machine. Coroutines are lightweight threads, uh, and you can uh, create uh, many, uh, many thousands of them. The main use case, uh, from my point of view, for coroutine in the spring world, uh, there are two main use cases. The first one is to use the Webflux and the Spring Data Reactive uh, new feature, which allow much better scalability, but while keeping the regular imperative uh, programming. Uh, the other use case is creating new operators for Reactor, because creating new operators in Java is super difficult. Uh, I usually ask to um, uh, Simon Baslet or Stefan Madini to do that instead of me. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit, bit difficult. So by using coroutines and Kotlin extensions, you can basically write uh, new operators more easily and also plug them uh, on Flux and Mono easily. So there is support, official support for, uh, created by JetBrains directly of reactive streams and reactor in the Kotlinx coroutine project, which is the official JetBrains coroutine library. In this support, a mono of t will translate to a function that returns a mono of t will translate to a suspendable function that returns a new label of t. So you remove the wrapper, basically. Uh, so that's pretty interesting. A function that returns a flux of t will return a suspend, uh, will be a suspendable function that returns a receive channel if we are talking about a stream, for example, for server sent events, or you can just use suspendable function of list if you want to use some kind of just some kind of asynchronous list. A mono of void translate to a suspendable function that returns nothing. So uh, be, be aware that uh, this support is available uh, has been contributed by the community. So Conrad Kamiski has done a very great job to support that on both Spring Primark 4, because there is also support for Spring MVC, even if that's much less powerful, and Spring Primark 5, and Webflux, and Spring Data Reactive MongoDB. Uh, we are currently evaluating that, because some people ask us to support that officially. So be aware that coroutines are experimental in Kotlin 1.1 and 1.2. They will be maybe final in Kotlin 1.3. There is no official support yet, but there is an open, open issue where we discuss, and we have begun to work with Conrad to see if that's something that we could in integrate. And uh, there is an ongoing evaluation of the performances, because obviously coroutine has a cost. It's an high-level abstraction. There is some uh, open issues about back pressure interoperability, so we need to fully qualify these limits. And also, uh, by seeing that, you can see that um, Coroutines are a good fit when you deal with a mono of something, so mono of list, mono of uh, a value, but uh, I think they are less, uh, power much less powerful when you begin to use advanced operators, do streaming, etc. So for if you just want to port your regular Spring MVC application to something that is using the new non-blocking uh, runtime, I think that's a good use case. If you really want to do um, powerful things, uh, uh, reactive APIs are still super powerful, much more powerful, and are a better fit. So up, up to you. Feel free to experiment with that. Uh, so what look like uh, Spring MVC Webflux with coroutines using the Notion programming model? You can see that that's very similar to our a regular blocking example, except that we are using the suspend keyword to say this function is suspendable, and internally Kotlin will transform that to uh, a mono of user or a mono of list of user, and we can leverage the regular uh, web flux and Spring Data reactive non-blocking stuff. Even that's not streaming, but that's non-blocking, even if less powerful than reactive APIs. So uh, functional and DSL, okay. So Spring Web Flux server come in two flavors. You, we have uh, provided support for the regular annotation-based programming model that is super popular via Spring MVC, and we provide the same for Web Flux, like shown just previously. But we also provide a new functional API. So this functional API is available in Java and in Kotlin. But in Kotlin, we provide some nice uh, DSL to be able to use that with nicer syntax. So the building blocks of this functional um, uh, thing is router function and handler functions. 
Router functions are basically pure functions that take a server request as input and return a mono of handler function. And the handler function, so router function is the equivalent of the request mapping thing, and handler function has the equivalent of the body of your handler methods. And it's a pure function that takes a server request as input and return a mono of server response. So uh, kudos to Arian Putzma who has provided that on the Java side. And on the Kotlin part, we leverage that to provide a better uh, API. We also provide a first-class support for the client side uh, with the web client uh, Fluent API, which is much more uh, powerful and fun to use uh, compared to REST template. So what looks like a functional uh, Webflux uh, application? It looks like very different uh, from the annotation-based one. So this is a DSL. So a DSL is a kind of uh, high-level API. So uh, the, the idea is to provide um, a syntax that is both declarative and programmatic uh, to declare your routes and to provide the handler implementation. So here, I'm providing a router that will, so you, you can see that it supports nested routes. So everything in the nest, uh, uh, every request that will match with the text HTML accept headers will be uh, routed to, the, uh, will apply to the underlying routes. And we see that we, we define a route with slash, which will return an index view, slash SSC that will return an SSC view, and uh, uh, on the slash users, I'm rendering a user's view with uh, attributes, um, model attributes. I can also use that to expose server sent events and things like that. So here I have put uh, routers and handlers in the same thing. Okay. Um, it, just if you wonder, the, the syntax with string and the lambda after, it's because in Kotlin you can redefine the invoke operator on strings, and I, can, uh, I use that in the DSL to provide a shortcut for a path uh, with the string. Uh, notice also that we provide um, a wide range of request predicates, so you can use request predicates on path, on headers, on uh, various media types in the accept or produces. So you, you ca and you can combine them with, um, you see this end uh, keyword, that, that's not a, a, a Kotlin operator, that's just a regular function that is defined as infix. Infix means that we can, we can call a function uh, without the dot and the parentheses. So in fact, this end thing is just a dot and open parentheses and uh, the, the parameter. That's just a trick to, to, to provide a more uh, readable and functional um, syntax. So the question is, how do you plug that into Spring Boot? Because obviously nowadays everybody is using Spring Boot. So you will generally define uh, admin uh, router, okay? So um, and and you will uh, you will be able to split the routers and the handlers. So usually in my application, I'm I'm defining that. So I'm defining a router. I'm using callable references. I'm just giving the reference of the function that I'm calling. And the handler implementation is like that in Spring Boot. It's a regular component. I'm using a constructor-based injection. And uh, I'm writing uh, this kind of code, uh, like we have seen previously. But yeah, for big application, usually, I split the router and the handler. Notice also that you can use uh, multiple routers. I mean, in, in uh, the annotation-based programming model, you have to, to put the annotations everywhere. Here, you have the choice of the granularity. So if you want to create a single uh, monolithic root router, that's perfectly fine. But if you want to create a router for your web pages, another for your JSON API, that's up to you. You can create as many routers as you can. And you can also use the nest thing to be able to compose them. So that's quite powerful. Um, Spring Framework 5 also introduces a functional bin definition, which is the most efficient uh, way to create bins. So in addition to XML, uh, which is not used a lot anymore, in addition to Java config, which is used everywhere in Spring Boot, uh, Spring Framework 5 introduces a new way to register your bin, and that's the most efficient one. It, it does not use any reflection, does not use any CGL proxy, it's super fast. It's using lambdas instead of annotations. And a key point is that it's like for the root, it's both declarative and programmatic. So this functional bin definition looks like, look like that. So this is the second. We provide only two DSL. You can use DSL everywhere, but we try to keep that uh, in control. So we provide the router DSL, and we provide the bins DSL. 
Obviously, both could be used uh, together in that way. So you define bins like in the old XML world, <laughs> except that's just regular uh, uh, Kotlin code. Okay. So here, bin uh, bin is a is a function uh, that takes a lambda as parameter, and in, in this lambda, uh, it's a kind of a deferred instantiation of your bin that will be called by Spring during startup. So I can uh, use this syntax to provide directly uh, a bin implementation, and you can see that it's plugged quite well with, uh, with the router DSL. Uh, if you want an equivalent of the Java config parameters when you can have a dependency from one bin to the other, uh, you can use this kind of ref method uh, that is leveraging Kotlin ref iterator parameters, and internally it is calling application context.getbin with the class. Okay? There is nothing new, that's just a, a new way to describe that as a syntax, but uh, underneath, that's a regular uh, Spring uh, dependency injection. You can also provide just the class, so for example, in this example for HTML handler, post handler, user handler, and markdown converter, you just provide the class, and it will automatically uh, do the uh, auto-wiring. So here, uh, the various parameters of the constructor will be automatically auto-wired. We don't have to provide that. It will be done automatically. You can also provide some kind of uh, dynamic thing. Like I said, it's programmatic. So uh, we provide profiles and environment block uh, to be able to create bins only when there is a profile defined or using some custom logic like that if you want to initialize your database only uh, locally. And you can write your own if uh, for statement. That's up to you. That's uh, declarative, but you can put a programmatic thing into that. So to plug that with Spring Boot, which is also a question I have uh, usually, you can use this uh, nice syntax uh, because uh, on the new run application function, we have provided a way to with a lambda to customize the created Spring application instance. Uh, sadly, it, it works for a running application, but it will be not taken in account for tests. So currently, what I advise to do, it's, it's less sexy, but we, we may provide some shortcut for that later, maybe. Uh, I advise to create a context initializer because, you know, the bins DSL, is, it's in fact reusing uh, an existing spring type, which is uh, application context initializer. So technically, uh, a bins uh, DSL is just an application context initializer. And I create an application context initializer class uh, that call in turn the, um, the various bins uh, DSL. And I'm specifying that in the context.initializer.classes entry in the application properties. And it will be taken in account for both running Spring Boot application and test. Um, yeah, my, my gut feeling is that uh, it would be it could be interesting to to take even more advantage of this functional thing into Spring Boot in the future, maybe. So that's just open discussion. There is nothing that will come, I think, in Spring Boot too. But feel free to uh, experiment and give your ideas on this uh, open issue. Uh, maybe you 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 could have some nice and interesting uh, uh, ideas to share about that. And we will finish this presentation by using Kotlin for the front end because uh, I, I think using the same language to develop the back end and the front end is something that could matter. So in my sample deep dive application, I have just a simple JavaScript code. I'm not using uh, Angular, Ember, or complicated things. I'm just using regular JavaScript code to display a notification where there is a new blog post in, uh, created. Uh, and I can use Kotlin uh, to generate JavaScript file because Kotlin uh, has a first class support for the JVM, but it also supports uh, uh, generating uh, JavaScript code. Uh, until uh, two months ago, it was not very usable for me because it was generating two megabytes of JavaScript for a single hello world. So uh, I, I just said it was uh, just impossible to use that in my project. Uh, but um, the nice thing is that with Kotlin team is that they, they are clever people which listen to users' feedback. And they have introduced uh, two months ago the dead code animation tool, which basically leverages all the information from Kotlin static typing language to remove all the unused code. So that's a little bit like in Android world with the ProGuard thing that removes a new thing. And with this dead code elimination tool, which is just a plugin, you plug in Gradle, for example. You, you are able to write uh, your front-end code using the same Kotlin language. So you have type safety, null safety, extensions, uh, auto-completion, etc. 
uh, and you just uh, generate uh, very small JavaScript files, and yeah, it, it can be usable in, in real, real life. Notice that Kotlin 1.2 allows to build multi-platform modules, so you could also leverage that to share more code between your backend and your, your front-end. The first thing I would like to say is, it's a little bit out of topic, but uh, I think that's interesting. It, it will be hard for Kotlin to compete with TypeScript, for example, on the front-end, because uh, uh, TypeScript is a, sub, uh, a superset of JavaScript, and it's designed to work with the JavaScript ecosystem. So I, I push uh, uh, very hard for getting support for WebAssembly on Kotlin. So WebAssembly is basically a native platform for the web, so instead of uh, running JavaScript code, you, you run a native bytecode. It's already supported by the four major browsers, so that's not something that... Uh, it's something that is really supported for now. If you don't know uh, what WebAssembly, have a look to this very nice um, explanation by Lynn Clark, which is a very good explanation of WebAssembly with a nice cartoon. And uh, I was at Kotlin Conf um, uh, last week to present the very same talk, and they announced uh, a WebAssembly support in Kotlin Native. So in addition to JavaScript and JVM, Kotlin allows to compile to native, and WebAssembly is very close to this native thing and could be generated with, with the LLVM toolchain. So it's super experimental, it's super young, so don't use that in production, but there is initial support to compile front-end native application. I know front-end and native are strange things together, but that's coming. And you begin to be able to generate native web application uh, using Kotlin for your front-end. And while on JavaScript land, it, it, it will have a time to compete with TypeScript, I think there could be a, nat a Kotlin native ecosystem that arises for the front-end, and that's a, 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 nice, a, a nice place where we could experiment. And I also think that would be nice, a nice complement to a Spring Boot on the server side. So thanks, uh, thanks a lot. I hope you had a good overview about uh, how you can leverage uh, a Spring uh, official Kotlin support to write uh, application with more fun and more, more efficiently. Um, I will publish the slides in a few minutes uh, in this URL. You can follow me on SDLS for fresh Spring and Kotlin news. And everything in this uh, presentation is coming from real life example. So you can go to this uh, GitHub repositories to have more details. Thanks.